like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. On today's video, we're in session number four of our ongoing series entitled Special Tests in the Chiropractic Examination of the Spine. And in this program, uh, we're presenting information to you about two specific conditions of the spine, that being the conditions of radiculopathy and myelopathy. And we're presenting this information to you from two different perspectives. First, from the perspective of a patient that you might see in your clinical practice, in your clinical chiropractic practice. And then number two, as a patient that you might see in a medical legal context, either in your clinical practice as an accident or injury victim, or in your medical legal evaluation practice if you participate in such types of evaluations. And so the philosophy that we've been uh, propounding so far in the first three sessions of this program has to do with the spine exam for radiculopathy and myelopathy and the nature of true objective physical examination findings for those conditions. <clears throat> when an examinee presents with complaints that sound consistent with either radiculopathy or myelopathy, but the physical exam fails to support either of those conditions, then those two conditions can be rephrased or re-termed or reclassified as non-verifiable radiculopathy and non-verifiable myelopathy. This is to be distinguished from verifiable radiculopathy and verifiable myelopathy. The difference between those classifications being that the radiculopathy or myelopathy can be verified by true objective physical examination findings. And in session two of this program, we talked at great length about the great diagnostic value of reflex testing, because reflex testing, as we discussed, is a purely objective physical examination procedure that cannot be manipulated by the patient or the examinee. So I love reflex testing. And then in our last session uh, on the physical examination of the cervical spine, here we began our orthopedic physical examination maneuvers for the assessment of radiculopathy and myelopathy. And we talked about true positive objective physical examination findings for either or both of these conditions. See, in our clinical practice, we accept it when examinees tell us that provocative maneuvers reproduce pain. But in our medical legal practice, simply an examinee or patient's subjective report of pain, subjective report of pain during a physical examination maneuver is not considered a true positive finding for that maneuver. The examinee is reporting only the subjective component of the true positive finding. The true positive finding has some component or some aspect of the flexor withdrawal reflex associated with it. And in that sense, the true positive objective finding is reflexive. It's a lot like reflex testing. <laughs> That's why I love reflexes because reflexes, reflexes are totally objective. So, with regards to the physical examination maneuvers for cervical myelopathy and cervical radiculopathy, when you perform those physical examination maneuvers, you're looking for the true positive objective physical exam finding, which would involve some component of the flexor withdrawal reflex. So with radiculopathy testing, such as the Sperling's maneuver or the shoulder depressor maneuver, the examinee's flexor withdrawal response the reflexive component of that would involve the examinee shrinking away from the pain, moving in such a way as to avoid the pain. It's a lot like touching your finger to a hot stove. There's a reflexive withdrawal of the finger from the hot stove in order to get away from the painful stimulus. So always, always, always be on high alert and hypervigilant for the true positive objective exam finding. In the absence of a true positive physical uh, examination finding, then the injury condition can be reclassified as simply non-verifiable radiculopathy or non-verifiable 
myelopathy, which is a completely different animal from bona fide radiculopathy and bona fide myelopathy. Okay, so important, important physical examination principle there to distinguish examinees in your clinical practice from examinees in your medical legal practice. Okay, now in today's session, uh, I have just a brief session for you as we go through the physical examination uh, procedures in the thoracic spine, and there's not a lot uh, that we get involved with in the thoracic spine, but the thoracic spine is involved with sensory, motor, and reflex testing. And then in our next session, we're gonna get into a more lengthy discussion uh, regarding the radiculopathy assessment in the lumbar spine. So with no further ado, uh, let's continue on in our program with today's session entitled Physical Examination Procedures for Radiculopathy and Myelopathy Assessment and the Thoracic Spine. Okay, so that's uh, the cervical spine and remember that the cervical spine exam is mostly concerned with uh, the presence or absence of serious neurologic findings and that's the whole philosophy of the AMA guides as we've been discussing as we've been going along here and with regards to the cervical spine the significant neurologic findings include uh, radiculopathy and myelopathy so just as a brief review for the cervical spine we want to focus on reflex findings. Uh, abnormal reflexes uh, could indicate uh, either radiculopathy and or myelopathy, with myelopathy being um, identified by the presence of hyperreflexia and radiculopathy being accompanied by uh, hyporeflexia. In addition, uh, we have with myelopathy, we have the presence of pathologic uh, reflexes such as the Babinski sign, the Chaddock sign, and the Hoffman sign, etc. And then with regards to radiculopathy, uh, we have several maneuvers, all of which are designed to provoke either uh, a disc bulge or a inflamed nerve root, uh, all of which, uh, when positive, uh, should be verified uh, by similar uh, activities in daily living it should be consistent with specific limitations and activities of daily living that your examinee will describe to you and then also certain physical examination maneuvers can provide validity findings uh, for example the shoulder abduction relief sign uh, provides an added validity uh, in the case of reported radiculopathy so what about the thoracic spine? Well, the AMA guides uh, do not give much direction uh, in the examination of the thoracic spine. In fact, there's very little mention in the AMA guides regarding uh, the thoracic spine exam findings. However, uh, there are some consistent features uh, in the thoracic spine uh, consistent with what we discussed regarding the cervical spine. So uh, for myelopathy, for example, the thoracic spine is going to have all the same physical exam findings as, uh, as we discussed for the cervical spine, with the exception that with thoracic myelopathy, especially below T6, uh, the upper extremities would be spared. So we would still see uh, pathologic reflexes uh, uh, at the foot. However, we would not see pathologic Hoffman's reflex uh, in the fingertips. But we would still expect to see a myelopathic gait, for example. We still may expect to see a positive layer mitt sign as the flexion of the head and neck causes a traction on the dural tissues at the site of the lesion. And so the only difference between cervical and thoracic myelopathy is that uh, with cervical myelopathy, uh, the upper extremities are involved. With thoracic myelopathy, the upper extremities are spared. Well, what about radiculopathy? Well, the AMA guides uh, do not describe radicular syndromes uh, of the thoracic spine. 
And if you remember the anatomy of the thoracic spine nerve roots, the thoracic spine nerve roots, uh, the anterior primary rami uh, comprise the intercostal nerves and comprise the uh, cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves. There are no known reflexes uh, that we can test for the thoracic spine. And even with regards to the sensory exam, uh, the AMA guides are stingy uh, on a description of the thoracic dermatomes, mentioning only the dermatomes of T1 through T4, and then again uh, T10 through T12. So for those of you that have the PowerPoint presentation, I have reprinted here table 15 too from the AMA guides. And uh, I ask you to bring out your handout materials if you're not looking at the PowerPoint presentation. And you'll notice here, uh, Table 15.2 describes the common radicular syndromes. And the upper part of the table is involved with the lumbar spine, and the lower part of the table uh, is involved with the cervical spine as low <clears throat> as T1 to T2. Well, that involves the T1 nerve root, the lowest nerve root comprising the brachial plexus. And then beyond that, there's no additional discussion of radicular syndromes uh, of the thoracic spine. Uh, figure 15.2 uh, is a diagram of the cervical and thoracic dermatomes. And as I said, uh, only the dermatomes uh, T1 through T4 uh, are described uh, in this particular figure. And then in figure 15.1, uh, showing the lower thoracic and lumbosacral uh, dermatomes, only the dermatomes T10, T11, and T12 are depicted here. And so <clears throat> I simply mention these diagrams and these uh, tables in the AMA guides to confirm to you that <clears throat> the guides uh, don't describe radicular syndromes of the thoracic spine. So therefore, what is the neurologic exam uh, of the thoracic spine? <clears throat> and what type of examinations would you do, uh, for example, to document non-verifiable radiculopathy? Okay, so if the AMA guides do not describe radicular syndromes of the thoracic spine, could you... Uh, could you support a case or could you support a conclusion for non-verifiable radiculopathy of the thoracic spine? Well, if you were to do so, uh, what type of uh, neurologic examination uh, would you include in your thoracic spine exam? Well, number one would be an examination of the thoracic spine dermatomes. And uh, we'll go over some of the dermatome landmarks here in just uh, shortly. Uh, with regards to the motor exam, there really is no specific motor exam or there are no specific muscles to test for the individual thoracic spine uh, nerve roots. For example, there is no specific muscle to test the T6 nerve root because uh, if you go back to your embryology training, you remember that uh, their uh, dermatomes and myotomes of the thoracic segmental levels uh, pretty much line up linearly with the vertebral level. In other words, there is no migration of the dermatomes and the myotomes and even the sclerotomes as we see uh, in the case of the cervical spine and the thoracic spine, be, uh, I'm sorry, cervical spine and lumbar spine which are associated with the limbs. And because there are limbs, we see strange and uh, twisted migrations of dermatomes, myotomes, and sclerotomes. So we don't have that in the thoracic spine because there are no limbs. So the dermatomes and myotomes are pretty much line up linearly and the intercostal muscles are innervated by the same segmental uh, spinal nerve root. Well, the intercostal muscles are difficult to isolate and cannot be tested uh, individually. So the motor exam uh, for the thoracic spine uh, 
uh, is mostly non-existent although there are some things that we can do uh, which we'll go over here shortly uh, there is no reflex exam for the thoracic spine and there are no uh, girth measurements to uh, measure for atrophy of the thoracic spine. So one of the things that we can test and one of the things that we can focus on uh, is sensation and by testing the thoracic spine dermatomes. Well, I've printed for you here on your PowerPoint presentation and in your handout materials uh, a dermatome map that shows the distribution of the uh, thoracic dermatomes. And the typical landmarks include the T4 dermatome, which crosses the <coughs> anterior uh, nipple line. T7 crosses the xiphoid process in the front. T10 crosses the umbilicus. And then T12 uh, dips down into the most superior aspect uh, of the groin immediately superior uh, to the anterior superior iliac spine. So we perform our sensory testing uh, of the thoracic spine dermatomes with both uh, SEMS Weinstein monofilaments and also with the uh, pinwheel for testing uh, light touch and pain respectively. In the presence of normal findings on SEMS Weinstein monofilaments uh, it's not necessary to then test for pain. But uh, on your uh, report writing template uh, you would report your findings on sensory exam uh, with some language uh, as follows. Uh, first of all you would describe the examination which is the test for superficial tactile sensibility parenthesis light touch. This sensory exam was performed using a SEMS Weinstein monofilament parenthesis 2.83 gauge close parenthesis. And then you would simply say there was intact light touch sensation to 2.83 SEMS Weinstein monofilament testing in the bilateral T1 through T12 dermatomes period. I concluded that function of the cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves was intact. Okay, so this gives you uh, a neurologic exam finding for preserved light touch sensation of the thoracic spine dermatomes. Now we really don't have much that we can do for testing of the thoracic spine myotomes because the intercostal muscles which are each innervated by the local segmental motor nerve root are difficult to isolate and examine. I mean, how are you going to examine uh, the right sixth intercostal muscle? However, on a global scale, we can assess generalized motor function uh, of the thoracic spine myotomes by testing the abdominal muscles which are innervated by the thoracoabdominal nerves. The upper abdominals are innervated by the thoracoabdominal nerves with contributions of nerve roots T5. Uh, some sources say as low as T7. Uh, T5 through T10 or either T7 through T10. And the lower abdominals which are innervated by uh, T10 through L1. So to test for the upper abdominals T5 through T10 your examinee would be supine. The upper portion of the rectus abdominis muscle is tested for flexion of the upper trunk in the sagittal plane through a range of motion <coughs> such that the inferior angles of the scapulae clear the table and the subject should curl up slowly to avoid uh, momentum. Now for a muscle strength grading of 5 or normal, uh, the hands are going to be on top of the head with the shoulders horizontally abducted in order to add load to the distal aspect of the upper torso and then the inferior angles of the scapulae clear the table and then you as the examiner would palpate the abdominal, the upper portion of the abdominals for symmetry of tone and symmetry of contraction bilaterally. 
for testing of the lower abdominals innervated by T10 through L1. Uh, the examinee is going to be supine again. And the lower portion of the rectus abdominis muscles uh, are tested for the motion of lower trunk flexion until the sacrum now clears the treatment table. And the testing the upper abdominals, we had the scapulae clear the treatment table. Here for the lower abdominals, the sacrum has to clear the treatment table. And again, for a muscle test grade of 5 or normal, the examinee lifts the sacrum through full range of motion 10 times. Meanwhile, the examiner can palpate uh, for symmetry of muscle tone and symmetry of muscle contraction bilaterally. And even though there are no radicular syndromes of the thoracic spine reported, it's, it is not impossible to have radicular syndromes of the thoracic spine. And these would be uh, some of the special examination maneuvers that would assist you in your uh, conclusion for permanent impairment uh, of the thoracic spine. There, there are no known reflexes to test, and so we're not going to find situations of uh, hypo or hyperreflexia in the thoracic spine. However, uh, we could possibly find some losses of sensation on dermatome testing uh, and some losses of motor power uh, on our global uh, scale of uh, manual muscle and muscle motor testing.